Hello. On behalf of RSNA, thank you for joining us today. RSNA also thanks IBM Watson Health for sponsoring today's webinar. My name is Dr. David Mendelson, and I will moderate today's panel. The webinar is one of the many ways RSNA is reaching the radiology community to provide education and resources. You can find these resources on the COVID-19 section of RSNA's website, which is updated weekly and sometimes daily. A link to this page is provided in the resources panel. With us today, we have Dr. Yan Chen, Dr. David Gruen, and Dr. Pina Sinelli. Before I formally introduce the speakers, there are a few things to let you know. Here is the RSNA disclaimer. Please take a look at that. Please use the question panel to submit your questions during the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted on RSNA's YouTube page within about one business day after the event. Now I would like to introduce our speakers. Dr. Yan Chen is an Associate Professor of Cancer Screening at University of Nottingham. Her research interests chiefly concern human and machine performance evaluations in medical imaging applications in their widest sense using visual search and computer science approaches. This currently encompasses the radiologic areas of breast screening, prostate cancer, lung cancer, imaging and chest CT, as well as digital pathology and surgical areas of orthopedic and laparoscopic surgery. In these domains, she has performed many eye tracking and other investigations. She is interested in artificial intelligence testing and evaluation in radiology and pathology. Dr. David Gruen is the Watson Health Imaging Deputy Chief Medical Officer and a practicing radiologist. After completing his fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Dr. Gruen went on to specialize in women's imaging and breast cancer. Dr. Gruen inspects breast programs nationwide for the American College of Radiology and continues to serve on several national committees. Dr. Gruen is also on the board of the Breast Cancer Alliance and previously served on the board of Susan G. Komen, New England. He also continues to practice breast and body imaging in part-time as a member of Hartford, Connecticut's based Jefferson Radiology. Dr. Pina Sinelli is the Vice Chair of Research in Radiology at Northwell Health and the Director of the Imaging Clinical Effectiveness and Outcome Research Program. She is a Professor of Radiology and a Professor in the Center for Health Innovations and Outcomes Research at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. She has extensive training and expertise in neuroimaging and clinical effectiveness and outcomes research. Her work encompasses development and validation of imaging techniques and evaluation of imaging to provide evidence-based imaging recommendations to standardize and optimize imaging. Welcome, Drs. Chen, Gruen, and Sinelli. Dr. Chen and I will now begin uh, by providing an overview to this topic and highlight a few challenges that we will focus on during today's panel discussion. I'm happy to turn this over to Dr. Chen. Thank you. We are here today to discuss the challenges we all face with the growth of the data in radiology. We'll provide a short introduction, which we hope to lead to fruitful discussions by the panels and all the audience. I'd like to start with stating some facts here. In, in 2014, there were approximately 8 100 million multi-slice medical exams performed in the US alone, which generate approximately 94 billion images. So this all need to be read by 32,000 radiologists in the US. Then each radiologist will only have two to three seconds per image to read. Those data are from six years ago and the volume of cases have increased since. Overall, the, the, it, the message is staggering. There's a far larger volume of information than 32,000 radiologists can handle appropriately in the average year. There is a magnitude of data. And then electronic data, electronic health record data also adding to this complication. 
Some 80% of EHR data are unstructured, including data that are readable by the conventional IT systems. On top of that, EHR data is estimated to double every two years. The point here is that in order to interpret a study well, we need accurate clin clinical information. However, it can be buried in a, a medical record, but it is unstructured and it can be unavailable to us. So what is the pertinent patient information that can make us a good radiologist, not just the image observers. One of the key questions I'm trying to raise here is how do we as a radiologist handle all those data? Obviously, another additional very important question is how can we ensure the diagnostic accuracy and also the security of the data? The current situation of imaging data, along with the EHR data, is both exciting and worrying. The future of imaging lies with bimodality. For example, MRI adding pulse sequence, more dynamic imaging, thinner sections. On top of that, we have added pretty remarkable technologies like molecular assessment with the information here, or with more of it, are we more likely to misdiagnose? If you look at mammography alone, we spent so much money on the potential unnecessary recourse and causing patient anxiety. How, how do we get it right? These are just examples in every field that we need help. And it is not a surprise with so much data, radiologists do get a burnout. So it's so easy to make a, a error. This diagram shows what happens when something gets missed. One of the point here I'm trying to make is really common challenge. Along the data pathway from the patient to the phys physician and to the radiologist, those pertinent findings need to report it back to the referring physician, then back to the patient in a timely and efficient manner. There's so many opportunities for that loop to get disrupted. There's a real hope and a potential for AI here to help us make the patient care better by creating a safety net. We have described what happens when things do get missed. From a human, from a human visual perception scientist's point of view, there are several reasons why do, why do we miss things. Here we have a slide with a gorilla present in it, yet is so easy, I think some of you didn't see it because it's so easy to miss because we are setting to see a particular imaging feature, we can miss a glaring obvious. Um, another example is probably from breast screening in the UK. A radiologist will read images all week and then may expect to see one or two cancers. So if they, read, they already get hold of one or two cancers on a Monday morning, are they more likely to go to sleep? Are they more likely to make false negative mistakes for the rest of the week? In the medical imaging research, we often use eye tracking to, to exam visual perception behaviors to help understand and to help understand imaging interpretation process of potential challenges. Here, here is the example. Both pictures shows that one of our recent eye tracking experiment that while recording and analyzing the radiologist's mind movement while they're reading 2D mammograms and 3D DBTs. The left one shows the setup of the experiment. The, one, the right one actually shows the actual recording. The radiologist read 40 2D plus 3D images in one session and verbally recorded it. What simultaneously the visual search behaviors was recorded with a non-intrusive eye tracking device. So what do we do eye tracking research for? We're trying to reveal the subconscious behaviors that eye tracking research provides unbiased, objective, qualified data and most importantly, it demonstrates 
how well or sometimes not very well a radiologist cope with this much data and images. Here's an example of what we are talking about. This is one radiologist's visual search behaviors from this study that when, the, when she examined a 2D images versus a 3D DBT images of the same patient. With the 2D breast images, she quickly searched, which showed by the blue lines and find our abnormality. While with the 3D DBT images, you can see that she searches more, find several areas of interest, while DBT is brilliant, at much better than mammograms um, in making abnormal appearance, making more visible, then it does take longer for radiology to read and to search for those images. So yet, this is another example of the problem that increased imaging data that we all face. One aspect for eye tracking that we can follow what's happening when a reader or radiologist here reading a series of cases that can take over a long period of time. Here is around three, four hours. In this study, we found over time, the eye fixation duration increases as shown on the right diagram, as you can see, the red ones and the green ones are much larger, longer than the blue bars. And also the two violin bars on the left demonstrated the radiologist's eyes were not opening as widely as they did when the beginning of the session. All this indicates the sign of a possible fatigue. This brings to the last slides of mine, which I would like to say in this slides is there is a burning need to understand what challenges radiologists are facing with all the, all the data, including imaging data and EHR data. And the visual perception research obviously help contribute to understand the challenges. And also I'd like to address the need to integrate suitable AI algorithms and systems to help radiologists appropriately. Before I hand it back to Dr. Anderson, I would like to formally introduce him as the moderator of today's webinar. Dr. Anderson is a professor of diagnostic, molecular and interventional radiology at ICANN School of Med Medicine at Mount Sinai. He completed his radiology residency at Mount Sinai Hospital. He's the vice chair of radiology and informatics for the Mount Sinai Health System, as well as Associate CMIO for the Mount Sinai Doctor Faculty Practice. Dr. Manderson has worked to shape health information technology to provide our patient with the highest quality of care in an efficient manner. He served as RSNA Radiology Informatics Committee and is the co-chair of IHE International. Now I will hand it over to Dr. Manderson to continue Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan, for that introduction. So we're talking about data today, and I'd like to focus one of my interests here, which is the access to reports and images. How do we get the data where it needs to be beyond the radiologist? Provider access is extremely important. How do we integrate with the EHR, all our different modalities, our radiology information system, our dictation systems, and now AI? Um, how does imaging move in the world of health information exchange? So health information exchange is rising and becoming a means of connecting all kinds of medical data. Radiology has kind of been left on the sidelines on this. RSNA, the RSNA Image Share Project is actively working to really incorporate radiology into this broader effort. Um, we are partnering with a company called Care Equality, which is essentially almost a USA national network of networks, and it has grown over the last few years. We maybe come back to that topic. In addition, we do use vendor proprietary solutions. Most of the radiologists and the offices on this call probably have been exchanging CDs for many years. We are now beginning to enter the era of web-based communication and exchange of images, which should be much more efficient than CD import in the long run but we're just beginning that effort. Um, not only are providers now uh, interested in accessing their images, patients want their data. 
We've started to expose the reports to patients. And in fact, in the United States, it's essentially required by law that results are available to a patient within three business days. Um, but we're also beginning to deliver images to the patient. How are we doing all of this? We're doing it, one, through the EHR portals, the electronic health record patient portals that are springing up left and right. We are doing it sometimes directly through software in a radiology office that lets a patient sign in, read their reports, see their exams. There are also services out there that are best thought of as image-enabled personal health records. And that was the foundation of the original RSNA Image Share project to get the images into these um, personal health records. And then from that moment on, the patient was in full control of their exams and they could distribute the exams, see the exams and read the reports. Um, to get all this to work well, we have to move off of proprietary solutions and into standards-based solutions. Some of the standards basis that you're gonna hear about in general are IHE, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise, HL7's FIRE, which is replacing much of the HL7 version two um, transactions that have connected all of medicine over the years, and DICOM, which most radiologists are quite familiar with as the foundation of imaging itself in the digital era, and DICOM Web, which is meant to modernize how DICOM images can be exchanged. So I would maintain that interoperability is rising of greater and greater importance in providing patients with high quality solutions. In the United States, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT has chosen to focus on this over the last few years. The two documents you see illustrated here are broad um, testaments and descriptions of how the U.S. should arrive at a fully interoperable, secure, and safe environment. Um, in terms of imaging, we all understand the value of a historical exam, especially when you're looking at an abnormal exam, and we need to be able to obtain those historical exams no matter where they reside. They're not always in your own packs. They have to be imported. We have to find them easily. Um, we want to reduce by having the right exam always available, inappropriate imaging. So that has financial implications as by some estimates, it's one of the major costs of rising healthcare costs in the United States. It's also a source of inappropriate exposure of patients in the population to radiation. So we really like to reduce inappropriate imaging. So I mentioned earlier, that um, the RSNA Image Share Project has now forged a relationship with an organization called Care Equality, which has really just grown in the last few years. It was founded as part of Healthy Way, which became the Sequoia Project. Healthy Way was a public private partnership sprung off the US government about 10 years ago. It is now a broad project with several arms. It is also known as the Sequoia Project, and one arm is Care Equality. Care Equality currently exchanges 90 million medical documents a month, but not images. So Care Equality is working with the RSNA to introduce image exchange as part of what they can move across the country. And they are publishing an imaging data exchange implementation guide as an addendum, excuse me, to the overall implementation guides for how to use care equality. Um, in the year, this year, 2020, we have four major vendors who are part of the imaging network joining care equality. They are in a development phase right now. They are running mini connectathons, testing among themselves. We are hoping late this year and at the latest early in 2021 to have them in a production environment so that if your radiology practice is a client of one of those major vendors, the images can be moved from any one to the other. Uh, again, opening up the door for easy, transparent, safe, and secure exchange. Care Equality program is open to all networks that exchange images, and they are free to join. Um, I don't want to misstate that. They're not free. There's a course to participating in care quality, but it's an open environment that has hundreds of practices um, and hospitals as part of it today. So my last theme here is 
as we move forward, radiologists need to integrate more and more with the clinical team. Radiologists need easy access to EHR information. So right now, most of us function with our risk systems and our PACs and a dictation system. We need to tie those systems easily and transparently into the EHRs. Other ways of integrating will be in practices, integrating the radiologist with the clinical team. So an example of that is on hospitals, at least, on nursing floors, where teams of clinicians assemble, put the radiology in there to read the exams, integrated on the floor with the clinical team, a new kind of radiology rounds. The last piece of this is going to be artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. So right now, radiology is aggressively introducing AI into standalone diagnostic imaging systems, kind of a more advanced version of CAD. But the fact of the matter is, this all becomes much more powerful when the imaging data, the visual data, and the clinical data are integrated into machine learning environments. Um, I think we will great, have much greater diagnostic utility together than just in standalone imaging. Lastly, AI has implications in terms of workflow, not just in terms of diagnosis. So these are all different ways of taking all the data we are rapidly expanding, integrating it into daily practice. So now um, our faculty is going to be able to answer some questions here. We are going to turn to an answering question session. I'll open up and invite all the panelists to participate. We would love to see questions coming from the audience here. But to kick this off, I will ask Dr. Chen a question, and then all the panelists are free to interact and offer their opinions as well. So our first question will go to Dr. Chen. What level of AI algorithm performance is going to be good enough to start using a given scheme clinically? Dr. Chen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mandelson. That's a really good question. I would say that when we say good enough for AI algorithms performance, I think there are two points we need to consider. One is accuracy, one is uh, efficiency. The accuracy is where an AI system maintain, in my eyes, that according to literature as well, non-inferior performance to a human reader. Basically, you need to be as good as a human reader. I'd like to use breast cancer screening as, as an example because it is an ideal application for AI. It's able to validate straightforward clinical endpoint because normally for a mammogram, it either be cancer or non-cancer, at least for screening. And there's a lot of published literature about uh, the, the performance ma matrix, for example, sensitivity and specificity, RC curves, is well published in the past 20, 30 years. And there also there are a large number of data and cases available for training and for testing. So this is what I would like to say about accuracy. And obviously we can discuss about what um, the previous trials and data in, uh, in the later part of the session. And in AI, we're also obviously concerned about uh, the algorithm's efficiency. This can be defined as reducing the computer need to train a specific capacity. E efficiency is a primary way in computer science we measure algorithm progress on a classic computer scientist problems like sorting. So this is just the two new two points I'm trying to make for, for the question. I'll leave the rest for the panel. Um, do either of our other panelists uh, want to offer an opinion about some of this? All right, if not, our audience is beginning to ask related questions. So we have a question here from, uh, pardon me if I mispronounce the name, B. Sahasa Ruby. And the question is, why the sudden hype in AI and radiology during COVID? Will it stay or burst like the dot-com bubble of a decade ago? Do any of our panelists want to tackle that question? I can start by just simply saying, I think it's almost coincidental, frankly. Um, maybe it got catalyzed a little bit by a drive to employ AI machine learning techniques and deep learning on chest x-rays and chest CTs related to COVID-19 patients. 
But in fact, all this activity has been going on. Both RSNA, ACR, and many others have been um, having a development of AI modalities for a variety of imaging techniques. And I think this was just an opportunity that um, just presented itself as perhaps something that would be an asset in tackling COVID-19. Anybody else uh, want to offer a thought about that? I agree. Uh, oh. I, I agree. I think that the evolution of AI has been from um, CAD, for example, as a detecting tool that we're all familiar with in the mammography world to a diagnosing tool to be more specific. It's not just a opacity in the lung. This is uh, consistent with or compatible with viral pneumonia. And the need to quickly respond to a pandemic has been perfect timing for some of the tools that we've been developing for quite some time to make that really important leap from AI as simply a, diag a detect detection tool to a diagnostic tool. And so it's been an opportunity that we can use it in, in the short term. And Dr. Mendelson, I would also just like to add, I agree as well that this move or push of artificial intelligence or intelligence augmentation tools in radiology practice has been there for quite several years now. The catalyst during the COVID pandemic was more of an issue of time. How do we move and interpret large amounts of data so quickly so we could use some of the information we're learning about a new disease in real world care at the, at the point of care of these patients? And that's actually, well, it's an amazing point and that's why we're here, right? Because it's not just COVID that has pointed out that we have unbelievable amounts of information that's available if we know how to get it and if we can use it in a timely, effective manner. Um, the data isn't slowing down and that's really why we need all these tools. Uh, one of the questions coming up from the audience is how do we gain access to AI tools? Does anybody wanna tackle what they think is the best approach to uh, seeing where one can attain them and evaluate them? Well, um, again, I can uh, uh, promote an answer here. Um, certainly our major radiologic societies are providing between journals and the meetings, uh, lots and lots of opportunity to see vendor-based products. Um, the RSNA publishes a journal about artificial intelligence. There are many other such resources and many of the other specialties uh, within their journals include uh, information about this. So that's one way of gaining access to um, an understanding of the principles of AI and how algorithms are developed and how algorithms are being evaluated. Um, in addition, vendors are quite eager to speak with you. Uh, RSNA maintains a vendor showcase that was in person last year. It will be online this year. That's certainly a way of seeing what the vendors put out there and publicize, and then vendors are clearly willing to speak with you. Um, vendors may also be willing to pilot um, some of their algorithms in your practice or have discounted ways of integrating them into your workflow and giving them a trial. Um, so there are many ways to kind of get started in there. Anybody else have a thought to offer about that? I think it's a great time to, to reflect upon your practice and what your practice needs are and whether you're a subspecialized practice with a particular volume in one thing or another or general practice. What is your environment? Are you a community hospital? Or are you an academic center? And then you can dive a little bit deeper into what some of the, some of the applications are that might specifically benefit your practice. And finally, I'd say find a champion within your group who can really lead the charge because it is different. It's a new world and um, we're early in the learning curve. So having somebody who's patient with it, who's willing to try it, who's willing to encourage and support will make all the difference in success. And I would just like to add to that as well, um, agree with everything that has been stated as well as the champion should work closely with the IT teams of your practice or your institution, as it is so important to maintain the data accuracy and data security when transferring anything outside of the department or the institution. You know, that's an interesting observation that a lot of um, 
the AI vendors are in fact cloud-based solutions today. So usually it does need to be a significant scrutiny of how that data is being transferred. Is it de-identified and re-identified on return to a local department? There are different ways of securing data, but um, that is something you should be paying attention to in your practices. David, if I can make um, one we, more point on that, I think sure. that one of the um, one of the trends we're going to see more of is the concept of an AI marketplace. That it's very difficult and potentially expensive for practices to select one or two and to decide which of the one or two algorithms. And the concept of a marketplace where a practice can enroll and be involved with whichever AI algorithms become released and rely on on the marketplace vendors, for example, we do it and others do it, to, to vet the products, to make sure that they're FDA approved, that they're tested, that the science and data and evidence are reliable. And I think we're going to be seeing more of that trend because practices don't have the resources to do the, the deep dive decision making that's necessary. So keep an eye on that trend. It's interesting because the other related issue there is how do you gain access to multiple algorithms, which I think you just touched upon at least one way of doing that, if only if, if each individual vendor only supports one or two and you need a whole potpourri. The second thing is how to integrate it into your reading workflow. How do you um, integrate urgent exams? Does AI have a value here for ranking exams on a work list for that matter? What's the notification mechanism for an urgent finding? Um, in our own institution right now, the two urgent findings we're using AI for are strokes and for pulmonary emboli detection. These are things that you want to identify quickly because there are often interventional procedures that need to be offered within a short time frame. Um, so the workflow around AI is almost as important today as the algorithms themselves. We have, a, as we're on the topic of AI, some other questions here that are related. How would AI help in breast imaging in terms of differential diagnosis of benign from circumscribed malignant lesions? That question came from an SOA. Yes, SOA. David, you're a breast imager. You have some direct thoughts about that. <laughs> I mean, I actually, I do. I, I, first of all, I think the holy grail of breast imaging is specificity, not sensitivity. We're good at finding cancer, but we do an awful lot of unnecessary procedures and biopsies and recalls to find those you know, cancers, those four or five per thousand. So anything we can do to improve our specificity will have a huge impact on, on cost savings, on quality, on unnecessary or, or negative procedures. I think this is perfect for AI. Um, Deep learning and pattern recognition are something it, are what AI does well. Um, it doesn't tire. So I think this is going to, to change the way we do breast imaging down the road. Um, I also, it's been said that if in 10 years we're doing needle biopsies, it could be considered a failure of imaging. So as we advance imaging and AI and bring in molecular imaging and radiomics and genomics into what we're doing, we may get to the point where we don't need to stick needles into lesions because we'll know without doing so exactly what the molecular footprint of the lesion is. And maybe it's 15 years away, but ultimately we're, we're definitely going in that direction. Can I just add on David's point that here we are trying to differentiate those AI algorithms or the AI products into three different ways. I don't think it's a, too much of a difference between the algorithms is how you want them to help you. So three different ways we're trying to differentiate them is one is are they do they work as a traditional CAD? You basically read with their support or the second one, which is uh, relatively new, we try to use them as a triage tool. So if they're high, if they're very sure, very, very um, non-specific or very low um, possibility of having cancer, we, we don't read them again as a human. We, we think they're fine or that you're very, very sure, the algorithm is very sure they're cancer, we don't read them again. So we only, the, the radiologists only read the one in the middle and that will really helps our workload. That's the second way we're using it. And the third way was very brave, I think, in the recent publications you can see in Nature that we're trying to replace 
a, a single radiologist because in the UK we double read and we don't have enough radiologists. We have an enormous workload of crisis. So we're trying to re replace one radiologist with AI algorithms and apparently it's 88 percent of the workload saving. So it, it's really see how, how you would like to use it. You know, that's interesting about the double read. Years ago, better than 10 years ago, there was a literature that was developing at least around lung nodule CAD on CT um, that two experts did not do as well as one expert and a CAD program that was tailored to lung nodule detection. None of this was perfect, by the way. I think the uh, best sensitivity was just around 80%, and that was one expert reader and a CAD system together. Two expert readers did a little poorer than that, interestingly. For those of you who are uh, interested in other things than AI, I will go there in a moment, but there's one other AI-related question here from the audience um, that I think we should tackle from Davala Katia. In the case of less diverse or scarce data, how can one proceed for evaluation? For example, COVID-19 CT scans for imaging data were less available. Anybody want to tackle that about um, insufficient uh, population of exams for AI development? That is a really good question, though, but you've got to start from somewhere, isn't it? I think uh, algorithms get better with more and more data that you train them, they, they do get better. So you start from somewhere that you then you feed a lot of false positives and false negative error back to it. I think that's the key point of that. I, I think, by the way, I, I'm not a technical expert on AI, but I do believe that we're just beginning to learn the pitfalls of algorithm development, and it's not straightforward. There's also a field explainable AI that's emerging as well, where people are really trying to understand what's going on within the algorithms. I think I interrupted someone. Was that uh, Pina? Yes. <laughs> I just wanted to add a comment that that is an issue and a serious challenge with AI algorithms and tool development that we need to be aware of. And we saw that with the COVID pandemic. And what happened there in my experience is that the AI tools being developed around interpreting chest X-rays, chest CTs, or even going through the electronic health record is that there was a lot of sharing of data amongst institutions. So those institutions that had large volumes of COVID-19 patients earlier on back in March and April were sharing their data with other institutions and combining data. I think this is where radiologists can really work together at different institutions and in different locations to share their data and increase the pool of data so that these AI tools can be properly developed and even tested. Do you see the um, pooling of data centrally or the distribution of algorithms for local training as a mechanism to grow that? That seems to be a debatable subject. I think some of that can depend on the volume that's needed to either develop or train the data set and the number that is available, whether it should be centralized. Um, I think it's best if initially early on you can centralize the data so that you could properly develop the tool and train it when you go to validate the tool it does become important to distribute the tool at different centers and have it run to see it's a good assessment of how the tool works in real world practices if you can sample different types of practice settings completely agree with dr sonali's um uh, point because uh, some of the AI algorithms are trained by the beautiful, most ideal data, uh, the, the images, and then when you actually come into the real life, and suddenly it doesn't work as well because the manufacturers is different and the, the model was older and it didn't it doesn't actually work. So the evaluation really is the key. Let's change direction for a moment. We have a question from Sarisha Yaduri. How are you planning to address the problem of information overload in the EHR? Even when all the clinical data is available, it is so hard to find the relevant data 
from the redundant information in the chart. How about the vice versa problem with respect to radiology reports? Clinicians may find redundant information in the radiology reports and may not find one thing they are looking for. Uh, Dr. Gruen, would you like to start our discussion on that? Uh, sure, thanks. It's a great question, and one of the huge challenges facing radiologists is how do we get, and, and all clinicians for that matter, how do we manage the vast amount of information that's available to have at our fingertips? And the way I like to think about this is when, when I started my radiology training, we used to have radiology rounds, and we were at the center of the clinical world, right? The internists and surgeons and ID docs and oncologists would all come around the viewer, the rotator, and we talk about cases, cases and patients and know everything about them. And so I think one of the great opportunities with AI is what it, this question addresses, which is how do we get to relevant contextual summarization? And I think that the solution or one of the best solutions here is using a field of AI called natural language processing where we can actually analyze the EHR, pull out relevant data sources, put them at the fingertips of the radiologist, or for that matter, down the road, the oncologist or the orthopedist or whoever, the ED doc is a great example, so that they have at their fingertips the relevant information to best interpret the study at hand. And it's one of the great indications for natural language processing. So I'm really excited about this as one of the places we're going to make a huge impact down the road. So, yes. Dr. Spinelli, you've uh, mentioned in your interest that technology continues to evolve and radiology is generally at the forefront of technological in innovation. Uh, relevant to uh, Dr. Gruen's comments just now, how do we measure are these advances uh, positively impacting patient care? That's a great question. And ultimately, that tends to be the question we all want to know. We can implement many new types of technology and artificial intelligence tools into our practice, but are we making any difference, essentially? And the difference that we're looking at in patient care is, are we improving patients' outcomes? But what I'd like to focus on in response to that question is we look more than just at patient outcomes. What we're really looking at, can any of the new advances in technology impact the patient care pathways? And that goes beyond the outcomes. And for radiologists, what we look toward new technology is can it improve diagnostic accuracy for earlier and more accurate disease detection? Can technology improve the risk profile when we do our diagnostic workup, such as using non-invasive techniques or advanced imaging with CT or MR angiography and perfusion and stroke versus using cerebral angiography? Technology can do so much more than that, though for us, it can improve the time to diagnosis. Some of our artificial intelligence tools, especially in the work in stroke that I do, are able to give us very rapid detection of perfusion deficits or large vessel occlusions or early ischemic changes or hemorrhage detection on head CT. And that really helps us improve our time to diagnosis. It can improve decision-making, patient care experience, and also cost. This, it's an area that we haven't looked at enough. How do some of the artificial intelligence tools help us improve the cost? But how do we know if our tools are doing any of these things? And I think the only way we're gonna know that is if we study it. And the way we can study some of this is by doing clinical effectiveness and cost effectiveness research so that we can understand what is the impact of new technology on patient outcomes and or healthcare cost. Dr. Chen, you're in a, a different environment than the US with um a generalized healthcare system as opposed to our fee-for-service system here. How is um, technology evaluated and um, introduced in England? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Actually, I, was, uh, in, I have been involved in the evaluation of AI um, for NHS that obviously from, from our point of view, using, again, using a breast cancer screening as, a, as an example, we are so short of radiologists and 25% of our radiologists are gonna retire in the next three years. We are desperate for AI to help, but before the NHS, NHS can actually import any 
algorithms and anything to help, we need to evaluate how, how good they are or how we are going to use it. So we have a new department called NHS X that is, um, <laughs> um, is our brand new department of NHS X with, with the IT department that we are organizing a, we, we call them standardized testing set which hopefully covers all the major manufacturers with all the models, uh, with all the standardized patient information and pathology information as a, as a standardized testing resources, a database for uh, every single algorithms or AI products to actually go through that test before it can come into the market. That's what we are doing in the UK at the moment. Obviously, even with our huge, um, very standardized or very centralized managing way, um, way of managing the NHS is still a huge challenge. How, well, we, are, we, are, we are trying our best at the moment. Here's a question that kind of touches not just on AI, it overlaps the AI and the general data integration issue. Jeff Morian, Moreno asks, you mentioned standardization of data sources between various players as a major challenge and it is a difficult problem. Is there a group who is attempting to set and maintain these standards? So I can start by saying that our professional organizations certainly are, are making efforts in that direction at several levels. So both RSNA and ACR, for instance, are just working on data itself, the purity of data, data ontologies, standard ways of communicating. I'm pretty sure you're seeing a greater and greater effort in radiology at structured reporting. Um, so the structured reporting efforts out there to sort of standardize at least a basic minimum of information that's in a report. And in the broader sense for the EHR vendors, certainly groups like IHE, which I'm the co-chair of IHE International, the idea is to again, identify standards and promulgate those to the vendors so the vendors implement them. And we begin to have more organized ways of, of handling data and then of doing data mining. Of course, the other subject here of natural language processing um, is going to become important in looking at free text data as well. Other thoughts here about standardization and, and ways of harmonizing data? When you look at data integrity, Pina, um, your thoughts as you look at um, programmatic use of data? Yes, I think that's always a challenge is to maintain the integrity of the data as well as the security of the data. It's a complex problem. It involves multiple different groups of people in order to do that. I think what we're finding now is that with the digital transformation to electronic medical records, ensuring the integrity and security of health information data is more important today than it ever has been. And as we know with the HIPAA legislation that was passed years ago, that institutions are being challenged to prevent and avoid any type of data breaches that could occur. Um, what I can say here is that many of the IT teams at our institutions and practices will take you know, large efforts in this area to maintain the protection of sensitive data by maintaining confidentiality of the data, by maintaining the integrity of the data, really making sure that the data and the information is reliable and it is accurate and the availability of the data. One thing though I do want to emphasize is that aside from all the security around data that's implemented at each of our practices and institutions, we as individual radiologists play a critical part here as well. And that's in compliance. We have to comply with the data regulations on federal, state, and local levels. So being closely tied into your department or your practices data protocols around the security is incredibly important to protect yourself from any type of misuse or mishandling of data, as well as to protect 
and most importantly is the patient's information. Specifically to the issue of groups working on data standardization, if you think back to my opening slides, at least in the U.S., interoperability and preventing information blocking has become a major focus of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. So I point you to those resources. They're easily available online. Uh, this has become the major focus of ONC and CMS in the United States over the last two years. Um, there's a recognition that um, vendors, institutions, enterprises may have been blocking for a variety of reasons the exchange of data, and that, that just doesn't fly any longer. Patients need their data wherever they are. Just before COVID, at least, we were quite a mobile society. Patients are moving around. They go to different enterprises. They get healthcare in different states. Um, we need to just ease the way this data is moved so that the whole patient longitudinal record is always available. And so it, it's starting with the government and that when things start with the government, there are often basically punitive damages if you don't comply. So that begins to force the industry forward. And then usually within each vendor, there is an understanding of the greater good. And given a little nudge from the government, people tend to participate. IHE, for instance, is really, uh, it contains, it, its membership is vendors and professional organizations, but the vendors play an active role and there's really a good interchange between different vendors, the engineers at least from different vendors on how to exchange information. I think you raise um, a really important but, point though, David, that I just, you know, I think we place a tremendous and unnecessary burden in the hands of patients. And if we really believe, as we often say, that our North Star is patient care, if you think about what the average patient has to, the hoops one has to jump through to transfer their care to get a mammogram at a different center this year than last year, or to have their CAT scan from last year done at, at one New York hospital to another outpatient imaging center in New York, we make that exceptionally difficult. And I think to, to your point, this is going to be one of the most important things we do is figure out a way to take that burden away from patients, make that data securely located in the cloud, for example, but make it at a patient's fingertips, not because I want to own it as a radiology practice. A related question is in here from Sarisha Gedaruri. Uh, can AI help with this? Can, how can AI help in summarizing the relevant information in the clinical charts and radiology reports and there, thereby presenting it in a much more digestible fashion? Any thoughts about that? Any experience with that? My own thought is, is that it's not here yet, but in fact, it's a great point. And I suspect it is something we're going to start to see um, uh, in wearing another hat, as, I know, as was noted in my bio, I'm the associate CMIO for our faculty practice. Um, there are vendors now pr pr um, providing solutions for clinical documentation improvement, where as the clinician generates their report in the EHR and documents, um, there's an AI algorithm running in parallel that points out yeah, you're tackling a theme here. You're kind of missing certain pieces of information before the patient leaves. Is there another part of the physical exam you should do? Is there another question you should ask the patient? So at least in that regard, AI is helping to improve and focus on the clinical moment, the clinical exam itself. But I think there's much more opportunity here, just even in extracting the data that, as pointed out earlier, is often redundant in the chart. One of the problems with EHRs today is it's not really what it was intended to be originally. It's a mechanism of billing documentation, not necessarily patient care documentation. I'm hoping we see all that change in the future. Anybody else have a comment about that? I actually would add that we actually have a commercially available product. It's called Patient Synopsis that just, does just that. It takes structured and unstructured data from the medical record and provides it on a pane of glass to the clinician's fingertips. And so, yeah, we totally agree. This is a necessity with information overload in the EHR. By the way, two of the major um, transcription vendors in the world of radiology are also significant players 
in the world of EHR transcription today as well. And both of them are beginning to demonstrate pilots of ambient intelligence where um, the radiologist or the clinician no longer has to type anything directly into uh, their product, into the EHR or the radiology report. In the case of the EHR, what they're showing is cameras and microphones listening and watching the physician interaction with the patient, and then AI documents the chart from visual cues and from the verbiage that the patient and the doctor are exchanging. So we're really on the uh, threshold of many, many kinds of advances in technology. And the question is, beyond the early adopters, how do we evaluate this and float it down uh, to the average practice? Um, we're kind of approaching the close of the hour here. So let me uh, go to a question that might kind of sum this up and then we'll see if our panelists want to contribute some thoughts about this. For radiologists to feel and ultimately be successful in the future, they will need to be an integral member of the care team. How can technology help them to achieve this goal? Pina, you want to start us off? Do you have some thoughts about that? Sure. I think that that is a nice closing question to this very engaging and interactive discussion. As technology continues to advance, it will be important for radiologists to become the leaders and adopters of, of innovation for imaging technologies, particularly and in health innovation technologies. Radiologists have a long-term successful history of innovation, assessment, and integration of new technology that will improve patient care. And this is how as radiologists, we maintain our role and value on the clinical care team because imaging is integral in so many clinical care pathways. And we see that in our own practices. So by embracing new advances in technology as the first time users and also partnering with companies to help in the innovation and development that we will have the opportunity to refine and better develop these tools in clinical care. Uh, Yan Chen, do you have a thought about this? I think that, well, we, we mentioned quite a lot of technologies and how radiologists and adapt those technologies into their clinical practices. I, I think once they embrace it, and I can see some questions of, are we gonna have two sets of radiologists, those who uses AI, who doesn't use AI? And I was hoping that um, AI become the technology, for example, like AI may become more intelligent, so you don't even feel they even exist and support your work, and then make radiologists more, more work more efficiently in the team. Uh, David Gruen. Your thoughts? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I completely agree with what the others have said. It's interesting. If you look at our history, with the evolution from film to PAX, we kind of made ourselves it easy for us to be forgotten. We could be reading anything, anywhere, anytime, and people, our clinical colleagues, might not even know who we are, where we are, what we do. I think if we embrace technology, particularly this technology that allows us to assemble, to use, to think about, to assimilate data to put patient care as our North Star, we're going to do this ahead of almost every other specialty. And it has the ability and the potential to bring us back into the center and forefront of patient care. And I think that's a great, you know, that's what ACR 3.0 is about. I think it, it bodes extremely well for the future, not just for radiology, but for radiologists as we care for patients. So great opportunity for us. So let me close with this thought. I trained in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and some of us may remember when there were daily radiology rounds and the clinicians came down to a film library, the residents would, in training would put the films on a multi-viewer, and we'd spend a half hour every day with the different clinical teams going over their exams. And of course, as David just pointed out, PACS kind of isolated us a little bit from that. Um, one of my, our colleagues, Dr. Paul Chang, uh, well-known in the RSNA and, and nationally, if not internationally, whose father was also a radiologist, commented, his father yelled at him, you ruined radiology. Uh, Dr. Chang developed the PAC system. Um, 
but things do change. Well, I think now if there's a silver lining behind COVID-19, and there's not many, having lived in New York City here, um, one is though virtualization of of us um, has now become commonplace, just like this conference. So technology may have a new way of reintroducing the radiologist into the clinical workflow, um, rounds online, um, rounds on a daily basis with us in there, teaching rounds virtually. Um, I think people who were reluctant to use virtualization technologies before have learned out of necessity that it works. And um, it needs to be refined. We need to ensure the security and confidentiality of what we do. Um, but in the big picture, maybe this is one of the ways forward uh, in integrating the radi- reintegrating the radiologist back into clinical workflow. Um, with that, I think we'll bring this to a close. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists very much for a very interesting hour here. Uh, I know I didn't get to everyone's questions from those of you attending this session, but those of you who I did get to, thank you. If I mispronounced your name, please accept my apology. And uh, again, I hope this has stimulated you to give further thought to these issues about our expanding data in radiology and medicine in general. Thank you.